Hello and thank you for joining us for the latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. You are joining us by Zoom, you know that, uh, but we just, as you, and if you've joined us before, you'll know that we just need to mark time very briefly until our Facebook Live audience joins us. Tonight's topic is strangle, something that uh, strikes fear of, of, of the mighty Lord himself into so many people's hearts when they hear the word, if you own horses. But hopefully tonight we're going to create a sort of a, an environment where that you'll leave and you will have a bit more confidence to be able to deal with this with this horrible disease. There's no getting away from that. Uh, I'll introduce them shortly when we have Facebook Live viewers with us, but we, we've got two of the best, and I mean that from a global perspective, uh, who's joining us tonight for today's webinar. Now, you're joining us by Zoom. We've got one poll question. Um, and so when we get to that poll questions, there are four options for the answers. Uh, please do uh, get involved in that. And as I'll say at the time for the poll question, there's no right or wrong answer. We just want to get a feel for who's joining us this evening. And, and I'm sure Basil will also ask you during the course of the evening where you're joining us from to see how global a perspective um, everyone is from. I don't think um, we've got Facebook Live with us yet. So unless Basil tells me otherwise, I'll carry on um, talk, talking until we do have Facebook Live with us. Um, but and also for uh, if you're joining us by Zoom, I'll, I'll reiterate this again. Two things. When we get to the Q&A, um, then please do use the Q&A function. There is a chat function on Zoom as well, um, but um, we don't want you to use that unless you're chatting amongst yourselves. Please just use the Q&A function. Good evening as well, or good afternoon, good morning, depending on where you're listening from, to those of you who have just joined us by Facebook Live. Great to have you with us. Um, and tonight we're, we're talking about strangles. And as I said, um, we are in the middle, well, I haven't said that at all, we're in the middle of Strangle Awareness Week, which is uh, the third time we've run. This is a collaborative international event to raise awareness around this preventable disease. And maybe we should keep that word preventable very much in our minds. And it's, it's a disease that's been around since Roman times and more of that from Andrew in a second, and is seen apparently in every single country of the world. But the reality is, whilst it does strike fear in so many people's hearts, there are some really simple ways we can help the, reduce the risk of this disease to our horses. And I've just, as I've just said to our Zoom uh, viewers, and I make no apology for uh, repeating it, we really do have the, two of the best people in the world to join us this evening, Nick De Brewer and Andrew Waller. Um, so just a few logistics. If you're joining us by Zoom, you already know the crack. Please use the Q&A function for your questions. By all means, chat amongst yourselves uh, on chat, but use the Q&A. And remember, in Zoom, you can upvote those questions. So if there's a question there you like already, then just upvote that. If you're on Facebook Live, then please use the comments function um, to put in your questions. And we look forward to plenty of questions from you. Um, for anyone... Um, who's been to this before you'll know that we've been running these webinars now for a couple of years all of them are on our world horse welfare education um youtube channel so please do um make sure that you refer to those if you need any, anything you think of out of tonight's discussion or any of the other webinars that we've done and also do share those with your friends and colleagues we uh, we've got another webinar in three weeks time and then we'll be having a break for for the summer and then we'll be starting again in the autumn so if you've got any topics you'd like us to cover please uh, email us on education at worldhorsewelfare.org um, and th the webinar in three weeks time on Wednesday, the 1st of June, is Bridal Fit. Why getting it right is so important. And we're delighted that an ex-colleague actually of, of Andrew's, uh, Dr. Rachel Murray, will be joining us on that. And of course, if you're on uh, Facebook Live, please do share the live video. Now, as before, we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to give you a very short question. No right or wrong answer. 
just um, to get a feel for the history of uh, everyone who's joining us. So have you ever been involved either directly or indirectly in a strangled outbreak? So there's four options there. Yes, directly your own horse has con contracted strangles or yes, indirectly a horse at your yard has uh, or, or in your stables ha ha has uh, contracted it. No, but I know people who have dealt with a, a case of strangles or no, I've had no experience of strangles. Now, I don't ima imagine, especially given the self-selection of the audience, we'll get many people answering no you don't have any experience with strangles but um <laughs> what do i know so now i'm delighted whilst you're answering that question to introduce our two panelists uh firstly um uh, um someone who i've worked with over many many years nick de brewer he um went to red wings horse sanctuary more than 30 years ago but look at him he's young um and uh, you would never know that and what's more relevant is the fact that he has a one an extraordinary experience in, in strangles in a really practical way and in many ways what andrew feeds him from a research perspective he puts back into in in a very practical way in his experiences through red wings uh, Hall Sanctuary, which over the years, like so many um, equine centres and equine rescue centres, have had a, a closer experience with strangles than they might care for. Um, now, normally, when I see, introduce Nick, I can talk to you about his extraordinary and very impressive array of shirts. Uh, but he says lockdown has meant that he needs a little bit more fitness training to get back into those shirts. And one of his quirky facts is the fact that during lockdown, Nick had more haircuts than he has had since lockdown. There's not many people who fit into that category. Um, but um, and also joining um, Nick is Andrew Waller, um, you know, a, a global scientist when it comes to, to strangles. Um, and, you know, he was a leading light at the Animal Health Trust and now has moved on uh, to be chief scientific on uh, officer at Intervec. Um, uh, living up in Yorkshire, he's um, into back. Sorry, um, he's um, predominantly focused on equine strangles when he was the Animal Health Trust. But I understand, and he might tell us that as he's developed it, looking into other species as well. Now working for Intervac. So, and uh, Andrew's quirky fact is the fact that he's a qualified mountain leader, uh, and I think this is very, very impressive. He's helped train many, many a scout leader. Uh, he's organised events throughout the UK and even Switzerland, and, and he obviously loves the, uh, helping leaders and the children in their care to discover the outdoors. But there's not many people out there who I bet can say they've been given multiple awards by Bear Grylls, but unfortunately, COVID has prevented him receiving them in person. But I have no doubt more um, awards are going to be on the way, so, th th so he'll certainly get to have that rightful honour. So, um, uh, uh, sorry, um, Basil, could we have the answers to those poll questions? Um, that, that um, uh, I can, I, oh, here we go. Excellent. Well, what do I know? I said no one's going to answer no, and 31% uh, of people have answered no. Um, so uh, that, that, in many ways, is really heartening. So we've got over, um, over 90, over 80% of people who don't have direct experience with strangles. So can I just applaud you uh, for, for joining us tonight? Because, you know, you, you obviously appreciate that it is such an, um, an important disease to control and eradicate if we can. So that means I'm going to stop sharing. I think the plan is, so I didn't say it earlier, I'm going to hand over to Andrew, who's going to speak um, for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then um, Andrew will hand over to Nick, who is going to speak for 10 to 15 minutes. Then we've got some structured questions but the, the real part comes uh, just before eight o'clock when we hand the floor over to everyone watching um, both on Facebook Live and on Zoom to, to make sure you get those questions in. So without further ado, Andrew, it's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for joining us and over to you. OK, thank you very much, Rowley. Um, so hopefully everyone can, ooh, can see this. Yeah. Can you yes. see the screen all right, Rowley? I can read the screen, but and I love the pony. Oh yeah, it's very it's very cute, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, a uh, nice Swedish horse has to be really. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank thank you for inviting me to to speak uh, this evening or morning or wherever you are in the world. Um, it's fantastic to to be here. Um, I've worked on strangles for almost twenty years now, and it it's such a fascinating disease. 
Uh, it's great to see that there's a fair few people listening tonight uh, that haven't got experience of strangles before. And, and I hope you'll find the, the topic um, as fascinating as, as I have over all of these years. Um, so the disease is, like Rowley said, uh, one of the most common, commonly diagnosed infectious diseases of horses worldwide. Um, it's often referred to as a respiratory disease, but actually it's a, it's a disease of the lymph nodes of horses. So the bacteria Streptococcus equi, uh, which causes strangles, when it gets into a horse uh, through contaminated uh, food or uh, water, um, it uh, rapidly it, uh, sticks to the surface of the inside of the horse's head and then transitions through to the lymph nodes. And you can actually identify strep equi in the lymph nodes after only one or two hours uh, after exposure to, to strep equi. So it's really fast getting in there. And often it disappears from the surface of the uh, respiratory tract so inside the, the horse's nose or inside the horse's mouth. And you can't detect it uh, there until the disease really shows itself in all of its glory. Um, so the clinical signs of the disease uh, start from three to 14 days after exposure and fever, a high temperature is usually the first uh, sign. So a temperature over 38.5. And that reflects uh, the, the real uh, theme of Strangles Awareness Week this week, uh, this, this year, uh, where we're asking owners to get accustomed and familiar with taking the temperature of their horses so they can spot this disease really, really early and get on top of it. And Nick will cover more of that in, in his presentation. So the fever is caused by the bacteria growing and multiplying in these lymph nodes uh, in the horse's head. So in the submandibular lymph node under the jaw, and in the retropharyngeal lymph nodes at the back of the, the horse's head. Um, and the bacteria, as it's in there, it's resistant to the immune response. Um, so the immune response tries to kill it, and it can't. And the bacteria keeps dividing and stimulating more and more of the immune response. And that's why we get these abscesses formed there. And the abscesses grow and grow. Um, and uh, like Norma, the, the picture of the, the foal that, that we have on the slide here, um, they can swell the abscesses so much that they actually restrict the airway. Um, and that's where the name strangles has come from. So you can get these rare cases that have really, really severe uh, signs of disease. And Norma, unfortunately, had to be uh, euthanized uh, from her infection. So the abscesses form and they burst uh, after a little while and we get this nasal discharge uh, appearing. So that could be really profuse out of the nose. Uh, we can get abscesses bursting uh, under the jaw, and so we get draining abscess material uh, out through the skin. We can get coughing caused by the sheer volume of the abscess material that's being discharged. It, it's quite impressive uh, when it really gets going. Uh, and obviously, the horses aren't going to feel very well at all, so lethargy and de uh, depression as well. The amazing thing about this disease is it can affect every horse on a yard. So... Um, if the horses uh, uh, aren't kept separate and we have exposure to streptococcus equi occurring on quite a wide basis uh, on, a, on the farm or yard, then every horse, so 100% morbidity, uh, every horse can be affected by this disease. And typically with strangles, on average, we get 1% to 2% mortality. But on these really severe yard, severely affected yards with high exposure, uh, to streptococcus equi, the mortality rate can be over 10% uh, in some cases. So it's really important to uh, be able to isolate uh, affected animals and restrict the exposure that other horses have during an outbreak. Uh, it speeds up recovery and reduces the severity of the disease. So it is endemic in horse populations worldwide. And in the UK, we have around 600 outbreaks per year. Um, and uh, that's pretty typical. Uh, with the number of horses that we have in the UK uh, and it's similar in other countries, the same sort of uh, frequency of disease in other countries as well, where the figures exist. But it's often not talked about as strangles, there's a stigma to the disease. And that's again something that uh, we're really pleased that Strangles Awareness Week is about, to try and break the stigma of this disease and get people talking about it more. Because by talking about it, we can prevent more disease. 
So only Iceland remains free of strangles. And that's because they've not had any import of horses for over a thousand years. So if you really want to guarantee that a horse that you're buying is free of strangles, then Iceland is the place to go. It's not only good for frozen peas, it's good for horses as well. Uh, so a little bit on the history of this disease. Uh, it's been around, as Rowley said, for hundreds of years. Um, it was first described in 1251 by Jordanus Rufus, uh, who was a knight. Uh, the bacteria, Streptococcus equi, that I've done so much research on over the years, was first identified in 1888. Not by me, although I have got a lot of grey hair, um, but uh, it's been known about for quite a long time. And my group were involved in uh, completing the genome sequence. So just like there's been a human genome sequencing project, we had a project to sequence the genome of Streptococcus equi. Uh, it's quite sad, really. But that was completed in 2009. And we've learned a huge amount about this disease from that. So in 1664, Solly Cell, uh, who was a, a sort of early vet, uh, said that strangles is a disease which all young horses must have in the same way as all children must go through smallpox. And at the time, smallpox was killing 20% of children uh, in the UK. Um, and that's hopefully the message that you'll get today is that's just not the case. We, we don't need horses to go through this disease. And there's various measures that we can put in place to protect them. But back in his day, Napoleon agreed with this. Uh, and in 1811, he, he wrote a letter requesting that all of his horses that were enrolled and going towards the, the front line to fight uh, should already have had strangles because it's such a devastating disease and he didn't want it uh, affecting how his army performed. So you might think from that that strangles might not be quite that bad, uh, but it can be really quite horrific, some of the signs that you get. So abscesses coming out the side of the, the horse's head. Uh, this is an abscess that's ruptured out the front of the, the horse's chest. Um, and this horse made a full recovery uh, very quickly. Uh, this is a lung from a horse where an abscess and a similar lips, uh, lymph node ruptured internally and into the lung. Um, and the, the foal unfortunately got pneumonia and, and died. And then over here we have a, another complication, if you can see it. I've got a picture of Roly on my screen. Uh, he's hiding this image. Uh, but this is uh, purpura hemorrhagica. So this is where the immune response is directed towards strep equi gets so strong, so severe, that actually causes vascular leakage. Um, and all the blood vessels leak fluid uh, out into the tissues and you get uh, this purpura hemorrhagica and other complications as well. So it can be really, really nasty. And so you'd think that um, with a disease like this, that's really nasty, lymph node abscesses, fever, we can identify horses that have got it. We should be able to isolate them. They recover from it. Uh, you know, 99, 98% of horses will recover from this disease. We should be able to, to clear it, really. But strep equi and strangles has got a real trick to it. Um, and it's all down to the anatomy of the horse's head. And so all horses have these guttural pouches, uh, which are located at the back of their head. And right next to that uh, is the retropharyngeal lymph node. So when the retropharyngeal lymph node gets infected and we get an abscess formed, so this is a, a, a camera that's gone up into the guttural pouch. And you can see the bulge uh, formed at the bottom of the guttural pouch here by the abscess. And this is a jet of pus shooting up into the guttural pouch from that abscess. So I hope you've not, uh, you're not eating your dinner at the moment and this is putting you off, but uh, it's, it's quite impressive the, the sheer volume of uh, abscess material that can be produced uh, during this disease. And the guttural pouch can fill up with abscess material. And on an x-ray, you can actually see a fluid line there uh, in some horses. And it's this material that drains out via the nose and it's the mucoporont nasal discharge that we associate with this disease. But if not all of the abscess material drains out of the nose, then we get this sort of thing happening. So over time, this pus will dry and harden. And with the movement of the horse's head, it will roll into these pastry-like bodies uh, called chondroids. Uh, and these chondroids still contain live Streptococcus equi. And every now and then, Streptococcus equi can be shed from these uh, chondroids and it travels out via the horse's nose uh, onto food, uh, grass, uh, into drinking water. Uh, and if the horses that then uh, eat that food or drink the water haven't had strangles before, um, 
then they're and they're susceptible to the disease, then they can uh, become infected, uh, incubate the disease, and then off we go with another outbreak again. So the real trick to Streptococcus aqui is the formation of these carriers. So um, really important that we have these lymph nodes for the disease that they they have these lymph node abscesses get into the guttural pouch and then form these uh, long-term carriers that look completely healthy, can move from farm to farm and trigger new outbreaks of disease. So we looked at the origins of Streptococcus equi and being geeky scientists, we looked at the genome sequences. And so we sequenced 225 strains. And this is a family tree of Streptococcus equi. It's the sort of thing you do on a, a quiet weekend uh, is generate this sort of thing. And uh, the little dates here give us a timeline for when these different strains shared a common ancestor. And we can go all the way back to the 10th of April, 1909. Um, and that's when the current set of strains that we have um, in the UK and Europe and the US uh, date back through to. And of course, this was a really interesting period of time <laughs> uh, in many, many ways. Um, and we had horses from all over the world. So this is the 13th Australian light horse, uh, which had traveled over to France um, and were fighting in the, the First World War. So we had vast numbers of horses moving from one country through to another and congregating together in pretty appalling conditions um, and mixing together on a, a completely unprecedented scale. So we had Streptococcus equi, of course, traveling with those horses an emergence of the fittest strain of Streptococcus equi. So a bit like the Omicron variant of COVID has emerged from the COVID pandemic. Uh, back in 1915, 1909, we had emergence of the fittest Streptococcus equi variant at the time. We had 8 million horses dying during World War I. Uh, and horse breeding programs such as the National Stud uh, were established over in Ireland in 1915. Uh, to replace those horses that have been lost. So you've got emergence of a fitter strain. You've got um, a lot of horses that were resistant to this disease uh, dying off and being replaced by younger horses that were susceptible to the disease. And then they were moving back uh, to countries all over the world uh, and taking this new fitter strain of Streptococcus equi with them. And so that's why we think that all of the strains at the moment uh, date back to this period in history. Uh, so it's like a legacy of the First World War, probably, or wars around that period uh, is strangles that we see today. And of course, horses still travel around uh, the world today. Uh, there's even a plane called Air Horse One that transports horses around from one country through to another. Um, so in the EU, we had over 150,000 horse trade events in uh, 2016. And we can actually use all of this sequencing uh, to follow uh, the movement of Streptococcus equi as horses move around the world. And so this is a study that we did uh, just recently in 2021. And we looked at now uh, 670 uh, different strains of Streptococcus equi from around the world. And I've sort of uh, produced this map here to illustrate where they're from. And we could uh, divide uh, all of the strains into six groups. Uh, so we've got an Australian cluster uh, over here, uh, we've got a, a main European cluster here and another European cluster here. We've got a South American cluster here and an American cluster here. And I just wanted to give you a, a quick example. Um, I get a bit carried away with all of this, so we'll, we'll keep it quick. Uh, but if you're interested, this is a really great uh, uh, study to look into. Um, and it's free, free, freely available as well. So microbial genomics, um, you just have to look up uh, globe trotting and strangles and it'll come up as a search. Uh, so if we look at this group in a bit, bit more depth, it's quite interesting because um, it's predominantly from the US, but we also have clusters uh, in the UK, Israel, uh, United Arab Emirates, and over underneath Rowley here uh, is uh, also some from Japan. And if we look at the Japanese ones, uh, the group in Japan that sent us these isolates had looked at these uh, outbreaks in more depth, so there's a cluster of 11 outbreaks uh, here that were from 1992, 2007. And they were all associated with the import of a horse from Indiana in 1992. Um, and then here we've got another isolate by itself. This was a horse that had also traveled from the US in 2001, but they'd actually caught it with strangles uh, in quarantine before it got out of quarantine and 
and triggered outbreaks in Japan. So a really nice example, I think, of um, how this disease can spread from one country through to another, and probably through uh, transmission from these carriers that look completely healthy um, and would pass the veterinary exam, be able to travel, be mixed with new horses and then trigger another outbreak. And so that's why preventing and resolving outbreaks is so important. And that's why I'm gonna, where I'm gonna pass on to, to Nick, who will tell you more about that. I love that, Andrew, thank you so much. Early entry for understatement of the year. You, you get a little bit excited about this. <laughs> it's <laughs> such a fascinating disease, it really is. I love, so much I, to, to I love your positivity about it. A, a, a cool disease. Many people would call strangles, many other things, not a cool disease. But uh, yeah, if you're a horse or a horse owner, it's not cool. But um, <laughs> as a geeky scientist, it's really, really interesting. And it's great to be able to do something about it as well. Yeah, well, here, here, here to that. So, Nick, over to you, sir. Thank you. And... Um... This will be a little bit of a gallop through. Um, has my presentation come up all right? Can I crack? Looking good. Right. Yeah, I like gallop as well, Nick. <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, no, so I, I was sort of keen to cover both the issue of um, trying to prevent it, which I think is the ultimate goal, um, but also to give people some reassurance about managing an outbreak itself. So. As Roly said, we're in the middle of Strangle Awareness Week, so there's loads of resources available to tell you all about the different aspects of Strangle. So even if you don't get to everything you're curious about tonight, you can continue to inquire and learn via the different charities' websites that are all hosting the week. So it's just going to really try and cover a little bit, picking up where Andrew left off, talking about how you might work your way through an outbreak management and the resources you can get there, the testing for strangles, um, I'm sure you'll have questions about that. And then tidying up after an outbreak, which is probably one of the most important things we can do if we are unfortunate enough to get an outbreak. So really what I'd like us to consider is um, that the approach is really similar to both um, preventing and managing an outbreak. Um, in all of them, you should have isolation as your cornerstone. Um, we recommend that if you're going to have new horses coming on the yard, that you actually isolate them once they arrive on the yard. It's so hard to be sure that they're properly isolated before they set off on the journey. You don't know if the horse box is clean. There's so many variables. Um, and then if you can manage a three-week isolation whilst offering good quality of life in that isolation window, it gives you the chance to do all sorts. You get to know the horse, you get to look for other diseases, you can test for other diseases, you can make sure feet and teeth are done depending where they come from, depending on the risk. But three weeks is definitely a good period of time for um, making sure that something like strangles isn't incubating. And isolation, again, is a cornerstone of um, managing an outbreak. When it comes to um, testing, again, um, it's so important to know what test you're asking for. And to some extent, the thing you need to do is try and ask, figure out what question you want to answer. If you know what you're trying to investigate and what you're trying to understand about your horses, then you can know which tests, which samples to collect and which tests to do. Um, because there's a lot of information going around, for example, about the blood test. And unfortunately, it's often undermining the value of the blood test because people don't um, necessarily select the blood test at the right stage of a disease or a screening program and then can be frustrated by either getting a result that's negative when it should be positive or um, that they test their horse with a guttural pouch wash afterwards and turn out it's negative and then get frustrated rather than maybe being grateful that actually they haven't got a carrier. And ultimately when you find horses with strangles um, that they do need treatment um, and that includes the carriers and it therefore um, is really those parallels between prevention and managing outbreaks are running all the way through. The clinical signs, Andrew's touched on those, and this week the theme really is about recognizing that the onset of fever buys you potentially up to three days before that horse becomes contagious to others, but you should have at least 24 hours. So if you're testing twice a day during high risk situations, maybe like when you've come back from a show, you can probably then get your isolation up and running before you've spread strangles around the yard. 
which can stop an outbreak from kicking off altogether. And even once outbreaks are up and running, you can start to uh, split your property up and keep your horses separate in a way that you can completely block the disease from getting into a horse that might have been in the stable next door. I think it's also really important to remember that horses with clinical disease do need help. Um, whilst isolating them, you need to remember that they need to be encouraged. They're going to be feeling pretty uh, grotty. So make sure that they stay hydrated, make sure that they're as comfortable as possible with your vet work out some anti-inflammatories, um, things like compresses can make them more comfortable. And then um, remember that actually, whilst Andrew alluded to the fact that you know, horses um, were expected to have this disease and a lot of people still have that attitude, quite apart from the horrible outside symptoms, these endoscope um, images show you a pouch on the left there, which is a slightly thickened, slightly inflamed uh, with a bit of pus at the bottom, but in another horse where the infection wasn't brought under control, where it was a longer term carrier, you can just imagine how painful that must be at the back of this horse's throat. All those reddish areas are open ulcers where the pus was sitting against the mucosa for so long that it actually just created these festering sores. So even carriers can potentially have symptoms which would um, affect their quality of life. So working through the, straight, the, st uh, the stage of the disease, the reason I think this is a helpful thing to know is that that window that I've just alluded to and that Andrew referred to between having a healthy horse that's susceptible, so it has no immunity, and getting clinical signs can be as short as three days, but it can take up to three weeks. And so you're not out of the woods really until you've waited for that whole period. And once a horse has got the disease, it can again be sick for just a couple of days and then be contagious for a couple of weeks. But sometimes these horses will be sick for weeks and weeks and then they will remain contagious even longer after that. And so it's really important to recognize that even when things look like they're on the mend, you can't um, rest on your laurels. You really have to still keep quarantine going and stay vigilant. One of the most useful publications um, was led by the BHS and I think developed with the AHT back in the 90s and was reviewed a couple of years ago. And actually what's really helpful is that it was um, reviewed with the benefit of the outbreak at Red Wings and outbreaks that the AHT had been monitoring. So we could see how well the steps process actually worked in terms of protecting um, healthy horses from catching strangles from horses in the field next door. Um, and the key bits about this are the traffic light system. So you will have the ability to keep the horses that you know are sick or that you think are sick, the ones that have been in contact with those, you keep those in full quarantine and then the other horses you can relax about, but just make sure that there's no contact and that includes buckets, um, transport, people. And it's really important that you monitor this all the time, pretty much throughout the day, check the horses, taking temperatures, doing tests as I've alluded to with your vet's guidance. So you're doing the right test and spending your money wisely. So monitor, 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 and if things change, change your protocol, change your, your, your isolation plans. And that way you can actually stay a couple of steps ahead of the disease and you can end your outbreak much quicker than if you just let it run through the herd. Um, that animation takes a little bit of time. It's available on our website at Red Wings and will probably be through the Strangles Awareness Week resources. Um, but that showed the, the workings of the STEPS program at Red Wings during our break, our break. And actually, if ever you need a bit of confidence, just go and watch that if you're struggling with a strangles problem, because it will reassure you how easy it is to make these things work. Even if it requires lots of physical effort and lots of time, it's not that difficult to come up with a great strategy. With the isolation, um, we always say to people, get the stuff ready in advance. If you've got an isolation for new arrivals, you can also then have everything ready to go shouldn't a horse develop symptoms. So really you want for isolation to have physical barriers, good signs, especially if you've got public footpaths, get a disinfectant that you know is good against strangles. In the UK, DEFRA approved um, disinfectants will work against strangles, but in different parts of the world, you need to check through, either read the label on the product or go through your government guidance. Um, and then you need to have stuff like jugs and measuring um, so that you can make sure you're using the right strength of disinfectant, um, all the little bits and pieces that make this an easier 
um, thing to put into place. We also suggest that people have full-sized overalls. Um, the le less flattering, the better, so that you cover everything. Um, we have hair, net, uh, hair nets or um, caps, depending on if you've got ponytails where the horses come up to you in the stable and want to nuzzle you, especially if they've been lonely during the outbreak. So not everyone has to wear these um, caps and gloves, but just think about how is it possible for strangles to get from your isolation out onto the rest of the yard. Um, and these pictures, I think, show that it doesn't have to be sophisticated. It doesn't have to be a sort of Heathrow style quarantine. Um, it can be something you can do in the field. It can be done in the yard. It can be done in the stable. And always have a way of getting rid of your muck, your dirty stuff. And just try not to bring anything out of quarantine that doesn't get disinfected. And try not to take anything in that you're not prepared to leave in there for the duration of the outbreak. When it comes to testing, I think it's important, and I've touched on this, that you approach this depending on whether you're doing screening or managing your outbreak. Um, and I think sometimes people get confused between talk about what tests you run and about how you collect the samples. So remember that watching your horse, taking their temperatures, physical examinations are really important. If you take swabs, particularly in the early stages of a disease, they can be really useful to confirm that you have got strangles. Um, then you can run bloods and you can also put the scope into the horse's head and look into the guttural pouches. But for example, in the early stages of an outbreak, popping a scope into the pouch is fairly pointless um, because you're not, and I think I've got a slide coming up just now where you will see that the lymph nodes are visibly enlarged, but there's no pus draining yet. So you're not going to be able to get a meaningful sample from that pouch wash. Andrew, I don't know if you wanna unmute yourself and just chat about um, your slide here, which is basically then the tests that you can run depending on what samples you've collected. Yes, yeah, so it's just like the COVID PCR test, really. Only this one was developed to detect strangles. So we've got uh, the bacteria uh, with all of its little surface proteins, its blobs uh, in the tube there. And we're, we isolate uh, the DNA from the bacteria. Um, and then we're looking for a target DNA sequence that's specific to strep equi. And then PCR, it works in cycles. So we, we cycle up the bacteria and each time we do that, we get a doubling effectively of the amount of DNA that's there, uh, that's to the target DNA sequence. And if Nick clicks a button again, you can actually see that on a, a little graph that the machine kicks out. And so I'm not sure if you can see my pointer or not, but there's a, a series of little red uh, curves here and then a green one in the middle. And we can use these red curves to measure how much of the unknown uh, how much DNA the unknown sample has in it. And this one's 5,000 copies of strep equi DNA in it. Um, so it's really quick, um, really sensitive test um, and uh, very reliable uh, to give you a, a, a very fast in, uh, result as to whether or not that horse is actually infected with streptococcus equi at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. so there we are, 94% sensitive, 97% specific. Oh, and then the, the blood test. Um, so the blood test is, is different to that. Um, so the blood test uh, is targeting two different proteins of Streptococcus equi. Uh, so uh, uh, this is just a representation of where those proteins uh, were um, generated from in the, the bacteria. So on the, the little diagram of the plate, the assay plate that there is uh, there with the, the little wells. Yeah, thanks, Nick. I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. No, we can't. <laughs> uh, okay. So Nick was highlighting the right area there. So we've got in the top left, we've got the, the blank. Ooh. Ooh, that's me. Too much clicking. <laughs> <laughs> He's click happy. Uh, and then the negative under that and then a positive control as well. You can see how that's come up as bright yellow. Uh, so that indicates a, a nice positive result there. And then the unknown samples are running duplicate on the, the rest of that plate. Uh, and it's the same sample on the left as on the right, just with the other protein. And you can see that in the box bit uh, with red, you can see this first one, uh, the top sample was on the day that the horse was uh, showing clinical signs. And then the lower sample was two weeks later. Um, and you can see how this particular horse reacted to antigen A, the first protein, right from the start. Whereas it took a couple of weeks before it started to develop an immune response against this antigen C uh, on the other side of the plate there. 
And that just highlights how ev every horse reacts differently to this bacteria and the proteins that it produces. Um, and it makes it really, really interesting to work on. Um, so for this uh, test, uh, a horse is said to be positive if either one or the other uh, of these antigens uh, is recognized by the, the horse's um, immune response. Hopefully I've, I've helped there. Thanks, Andrew. So I think the important thing probably to remember is that guttural pouch scoping is really helpful for managing tricky diseases, tricky cases, but it's good for screening horses where you have new arrivals that you want to be absolutely sure it's the gold standard. And when you're managing an outbreak to make sure that a horse doesn't become a carrier because it hasn't recovered fully. So this slide shows you um, the floor of the guttural pouch, two different examples where there's really big swellings on the floor. These are lymph nodes that could well burst or they may be recovering, but they're not necessarily going to be producing enough pus for you to detect. And so these horses um, wouldn't necessarily be the ones in the early stages of disease that would be um, worth spending your money on sending stuff away to the labs. And then just talking about the carriers, Andrew has introduced the concept of the carriers. And we have an animation for that too, which I will let you watch at your leisure after today. Um, but the important thing to remember is that the pus that bursts out of the guttural pouch, out of the lymph nodes into the guttural pouch can thicken to the point that it then doesn't run down the nose. But the bacteria can survive in that and then infect the next horse at some point in the future. And we've had a horse at Red Wings that was still testing positive for strangles with live bacteria five years after he was known to have strangles himself. So nowadays we jump on board and we get rid of that sooner. Um, but it's important to recognize that this is how apparently healthy horses can suddenly be responsible for a new outbreak on a new yard. Um, through the scope, the other thing just to remember, one of the reasons why we're so keen that people scope soon after um, a horse is recovering from strangles, this shows you a guttural pouch that is absolutely heaving. There isn't a square centimeter inside this poor horse's pouch that doesn't have thick pus. It's literally like a crumbly cheddar cheese. It is so difficult to work with. Um, and this would have needed surgery to actually resolve um, because it was impossible to actually pull it out through the scope. So they're not common these cases, but when they happen, they can again cause the horse in intense discomfort and they can also be a real nightmare for the owners. Other times you might have a single chondroid and the younger chondroids soon after infection will often form into a single mass or break into a number of easy to see sort of masses. They're about the size of a raisin or maybe a sugar coated almond. In the early stages, they're not very strong, so they'll break apart. Otherwise, uh, and then you can crumble them up into small bits and rinse them out of the head. Otherwise, you just try and pull the chondroid out as a whole. So I've got a little video here to show you the scope going into the pouch of a horse that was uh, known to be a carrier. Um, we sometimes find these horses during our routine screening at Red Wings as they come through the quarantine, and that's the whole reason why we scope every horse that comes in. Um, we're using a probe here to guide us into the pouches because they're quite tricky. You can't just drive the scope straight in there. So it does take a little bit of practice, but it's thankfully something that um, vets are becoming really familiar with and getting really good at. Once you've got the nap, you can do this in a couple of minutes. Um, usually there's always someone sticking to your lens, so you do need to be able to clean the lens to see what you're doing. So that's where this flickering and blurring comes from. And now you can see what is a very otherwise healthy guttural pouch. You can see all the tissues really nicely. You wouldn't suspect there's a problem and suddenly there's just one little nugget about the size of a raisin waiting to cause another outbreak. That's all it takes. Sometimes these chondroids will be negative for strangles, so the infection has died out, but we found more that are positive than that are negative out of the horses that we've scoped over the years. And if they are firm enough, then once you've grabbed hold of them, it's possible to bring them out in a single piece, and then you give them a good flush, and once the the pouch has been physically rinsed clean, those horses will tend to go back to being uh, normal, no contagiousness, and can then go back into the herd and be perfectly safe. 
Um, and then I've got one short video, really. I don't know how we're doing for time, but this is a pony that suffered strangles during our outbreak. Do you want me to show this, Roly? Yeah, yeah, go, go, go for it quick. Okay, so I think this is a really good example of us stepping in. Um, this horse had uh, no longer shown clinical signs for a couple of weeks, um, but you can still see how dirty it is at the back of the guy's throat. Um, here we have a chondroid in the one side of the pouch, but um, that one is someone that we could pull out. They, they don't always jump straight into the basket for you. So it took a bit of time to um, move it around and actually grab hold of it. So this is edited highlights. But you'll notice that once we've got this out, there is actually an area of inflammation in the pouch. And that's where there's still active um, pus being formed in the lymph node and still being produced and discharged into the pouch. So this horse would still carrying on. You can see it there. There's a little wound there, which is still draining fresh pus. But as it gets thicker and thicker, as it slows down, that horse will then not become more, um, uh, won't produce any more. And then you can finish the job by going in there and clear everything out. And this is the other side of the head on the same guy. Um, and Again, you have a suspicion that it might be a bit messy in there. And he had, again, a free chondroid in the pouch, but you can see here and appreciate really clearly this lymph node is still producing pus. And actually this big chondroid is trapped inside that opening. Um, and that took another couple of weeks to resolve. Um, but we managed to pull out the, the loose chondroid and then we gave that guy another couple of weeks to come right. Um, he was called Kensington um, from one of the cases in the M25 from many years ago. And thankfully, his next test, um, several weeks later, he was completely clear and he managed to rejoin the herd. So just to really summarize, um, I think it's so important to understand the disease that you're trying to prevent and control, because the more you understand the disease, the easier it is to do the right thing at the right time. Roly, I think Wilders Welfare did a fabulous survey a little while ago where they showed that actually the effectiveness of biosecurity measures on a yard was, was linked to whether or not the yard had a protocol, whether the protocol was actually written down and displayed on the yard. So make it part of your community and then follow the protocol with new arrivals, with events and with outbreaks, because there's no point having it written up and stuck on the tack room wall if you don't actually use it. That's what it's there for. And just stay up to date because a new vaccine is on the horizon, like really soon. Tests are improving all the time. So there's always new and better ways for us to get on top of this disease. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Nick. I think you were referring to Equine Disease Coalition uh, survey that, that, that absolutely showed the importance, the practical importance. So, Guys, brilliant. I love the interplay, um, the way you handed all the technical stuff over to Andrew, which we'll, we'll, Nick will carry on with that um, during the course of the questions. So just a few questions to start. And Nick, I'll come to you first. Um, we, I mean, World Horse Welfare, Red Wings, you know, we all know the importance that you know, the impact that strangles can have uh, on horses and our care. So all of our horses spend time in quarantine and are tested before they join the main yard or main herd. We are lucky, you know, Red Wings and World Horse Welfare, we're lucky to have the facilities that make this easy for, for us to achieve. But how important are dedicated isolation facilities for those on livery yards or where the facilities might not be so easy? Yeah, I think there's something that comes up, up to us on a regular basis as well. I think you don't need to have an all singing, all dancing yard. I think what you do need to do is I think you should have a part of the yard that's always there ready for new horses that are arriving to be isolated, that you, you don't have every stable occupied or you don't have every field occupied. It's just always worth having somewhere where a new horse can safely live for a few weeks um, but it can be a field. In summer, it could just be outside with a hedge. In winter, it could be a field shelter. It doesn't have to be sophisticated. You just need to be able to um, get to and from the horse. The horse ideally needs to see other horses or have some kind of social interaction. Um, and it needs to be easy for you to take food to the horse, go and look after it, check it regularly, and to take muck away or to pile up the muck next door. I mean, 90 something percent of our horses that come in are fine. So at the end of quarantine, the muck just goes into the normal mucky, but it doesn't have to be sophisticated. But I really think 
it's important that there's a dedicated part of the yard that's always available, even if it means that, you know, horses that normally use that stable, but in an, in an outbreak situation or when you've got new horses arriving, that horse can then go and stay somewhere else, maybe go and live back in with its friend, something like that. Um, so, you know, it needs to be affordable for the yard, but it's just so important to have something available. Yeah. yeah. And it's so important to have sorted that out during peacetime when you don't have disease. Yeah. It's a nightmare to try and enjoy, do it. And, and you picked up on a really important, because when we talk about isolation and quarantine, so many people balk and quite understandably say, well, my horse would be so stressed if we had to isolate it for two weeks, three weeks. But as you said, there are some practical ways of, of ensuring that to reduce that stress through letting them have sight with other horses and, and, and so on. Is there any other guidance on reducing that isolation challenges yeah I, mean, I think what the, one of the good things with strangles is that you could literally have the horse next door to another horse's stable and just put blankets up and that could be enough if it's equine flu a, a new horse anywhere on the yard is a risk because it'll float on the air if it's ringworm contact so depending on the diseases but i mean you could get your horses vaccinated with flu before they come on the yard you could get them vaccinated for strangles too but I think you can make it quite easy to just have not very much separation. They can see other horses as, as long as they can't touch them and cough on them, strangles won't get very far. Um, so yeah, you can, and then, you know, things like um, uh, the mirrors and the street balls, all of these little things can help, but often just having sight of the activities in the yard and seeing other horses is, is enough for, for the horses to cope with it better than not. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for that. I might well come back to that during the Q, uh, open Q&A. Andrew, um, when bringing a horse onto a yard, we often view the horse that's coming onto the yard as risky and the resident horse as safe in terms of, of disease and in this regard, it's particularly strangles. Is that a correct assumption? Yeah, so we've we've seen that actually it's not always the case that that's that's the way it is i mean certainly bringing a new horse on if that horse has been mixing with other horses um, maybe it's been transported and the the vehicle hasn't been cleaned uh, before that new horse has got into it so there's a risk of spreading infection that way um, so certainly a new horse arriving does pose an infectious risk to the resident horses but then you often find out we often find out that there has been an endemic problem at the receiving yard. Um, and so actually there's carriers at the receiving yard that are, are all healthy, so they're not affected. So it's the poor new horse that comes in that's naive, that then gets exposed to strep equi from the carriers that are already there. It develops signs of strangles and everyone thinks it's brought it in, but actually it caught it from the, the existing horses that were already there. And, and things like the blood test can potentially show that up. Uh, so if you blood test the resident horses as well, you can identify that at least some of those are going to test uh, positive. Um, and then that can give you a, an idea that there was a problem already on the yard before the new horse arrived. Um, or a history of disease, if the horses have had strangles before. And like Nick said, uh, you know, scoping horses at the end of an outbreak, if that hasn't happened, then um, I think uh, from Richard Newton's data, Nick will correct me, I think 75% of outbreaks that have more than 10 horses, I think it was, um, uh, had a carrier um, coming through at the end of that outbreak. And so if you've had an outbreak and you haven't scoped and cleared up and identified those carriers, then um, there's a fair old chance there's, there's one there waiting. Yeah. So a new arrival is always going to pose a risk to a resident horse population, but a resident horse population can uh, pose a risk yeah. to new arrivals. And if you get an outbreak from a new arrival uh, case, it's not necessary it bringing it in. It's it's so just make it's as ever making sure we ask the right questions, isn't it? Yeah, we? I mean we sequence some uh, strains from an outbreak in Essex, and you could see the outbreak strain. But one of the existing horses actually was infected with two different strains at the same time. Okay. So there were two other strains, and there was only 10 horses on the yard. There were three strains circulating that yard of 10 horses. There was the strain that was causing the active outbreak, and then there were carriers on that, two carriers on that, that yard as well. One with one strain and one carrier with two strains at the same time. 
So for the vet that was attending, it was just a nightmare, yeah, yeah. you know, to, to work out what was going on. Yeah, a real jigsaw puzzle. Um, so, Nick, although it's not a particularly deadly disease, strangles can make horses quite ill. Uh, do you know how roughly much it would cost an owner to deal with a case of strangles? Yeah, I think it's the, the fact that it doesn't discriminate. Um, I think we all know that falls and welfare cases that were, um, you know, really poor before they caught it will potentially have a worse run of the disease. But I think everyone who's had the disease will know that some of the horses that were really badly affected, there's no rhyme or reason why they went down with it worse. And some of these horses can be so sick that owners are worried about losing them. Occasionally we lose these horses. Sometimes the purpura hemorrhagic, it captures them afterwards. Um, sometimes you discover bastard strangles. Um, that can appear a year later as a colic. So in those sort of cases, you could spend three grand taking your horse to Newmarket for colic surgery to find that actually it's untreatable, but you've already spent the best part of those 3,000 pounds getting it that far. Um, in terms of you know, a straightforward outbreak, you could probably just have the vet come once and diagnose and then help you along in an advisory capacity. They're not necessarily that expensive, but the big cost comes to the fact that the reputation of your stables, even if it's just a private yard, can be damaged. People might not want you to enter their shows. Uh, livery yards might have to cancel events. So I think often the economic impact isn't so much the individual horse's disease as it is that the ramifications. And if if not, if, if everyone's not working together on, on a yard to get it under control, um, you know, we've seen cases rumble on for two years. Um, yeah. And sometimes they go on for a good six months before everyone finally realizes they have to work together. And the disruption in that time, I mean, a five litre container of disinfectant is 30 to 60 quid. Um, and you're going through that like a dose of salts in an outbreak. So I think that's where the real um, financial stuff comes from. I mean, scoping can cost as little as 150 quid plus the lab fee right up to six, 800 quid. Um, I would rather stick a, a scope in a horse twice and just rinse out that sticky pus than have to spend six hours scoping the horse on many occasions trying to pull chondroids out from a tricky case. And I've just helped people down in Dartmoor where I've spent on average three hours per horse over two or three sessions um, trying to clear them up because they were so badly infected. In this, both situations, a third of the horses, so 10 out of 30 horses, were completely gunked up yeah. and of those two or three of them took me 10 minutes to fix and the others just took hours and hours so you never quite know which one's going to be the awful case that's going to cost the owner a lot of money so again I would think it's better to spend a bit more <clears throat> early after they've recovered and just end up having to rinse them out and I think this is where maybe you know yards working together if everyone decides they're going to scope their horse three weeks after they've recovered then they can all club together to pay for the one horse that might need three or four treatments, as opposed to maybe half the yard having to have their horses scoped three, four times. Um, and this is kind of, you know, where again, it's a disease where if the community works together, you get a better result. Absolutely, that's a very strong message coming from for you now, Nick, thank you very much. Um, Andrew, to come back to your uh, earlier question. If, if a horse goes onto a yard, um, and that horse is strangles positive, um, or is 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 um, excreting um, uh, it, bacteria in its um, uh, coughs or, or, or snots. Will all the horses on that yard um, get strangles, or will, might some get it? Um, is there a different level of um, uh, sort of susceptibility with horses? Yeah. Yeah, so absolutely. Uh, so, um, yes, <laughs> there is, is the short answer. Um, so in the studies that we did, um, we actually had a project, um, a, a really talented Spanish uh, scientist, uh, Maria Lopez, uh, was looking at this and we were sequencing the DNA of horses um, and looking and she'd identified some mutations that were associated with increased and decreased risk uh, of serious disease. So I think just naturally the way that the horse's immune system works, because we're up, humans are all different, horses are all different, uh, we'll respond to these uh, pathogens differently. A classic example, I guess, is like COVID at the moment. And some people get really seriously ill 
other people don't even realize that they've got it. Mm. Uh, strangles is probably a bit more reliable at inducing disease, uh, certainly if people get enough of it, uh, enough of a dose. But we do see some horses uh, having it more severely, and it, it could be their innate uh, immune response that they have, or it could be if they've been exposed to strep equi uh, before and they've got a little bit of resistance to it already, uh, that can make a difference with it. But certainly reducing the dose that they receive by using effective biosecurity measures is really important. That, that benefits all horses. Right, fine. So we heard so much about viral load at the start of the pandemic, didn't we? And this is bacterial load. exactly. Yeah, it's like hands, face and space, but for yeah. horses. Yeah, we're just, we, we need to come up with a strap line, don't we? Well, chuck a hoof in there and I'm sure we'll be. Yeah. <laughs> um, Nick, this is an interesting question. Is strangles uh, generally a disease that are horses that are not looked after properly? Yeah, that's a great way of, you know, I think this really does tie in with why often outbreaks were linked to people being really horrible about each other and why often the stigma of strangles meant that people would keep quiet about it. Um, I think the answer is yes, in the sense that if, if there's yards where there's a lot of horses coming and going, where there's no biosecurity, that would make strangles easier to find its way in and out. But that's a different kind of neglect. I think when we see horses like Kensington, who was literally, how he ever stood up, I don't know. He was one of the thinnest horses I've ever seen. So he was a really bad welfare case, but he recovered fully before he caught strangles and he didn't have it particularly badly. So I think um, a lot of the time, strangles will affect really valuable horses that just didn't expect it. But we tend to focus on the ones like the dealer's yards where there's lots of comings and goings and then someone buys a horse from that dealer and then strangle starts on the yard. So there's sort of an association that I think if biosecurity is poor, then yes. Um, but actually healthy horses can get it just as badly as um, some of the welfare cases. And I think that's where one shouldn't really ever think that somebody's neglected their horse because their horse has got strangles. I think it can happen to the best of us. And I think that's, um, that's only true when you start to test more often and then suddenly realize that actually often a mild case of strangles gets dismissed as just being a little bit of a, an off day and then turns out to be positive. So it's probably far more prevalent in the well cared for horses than we think about. That's a really good point. So, I mean, yeah, don't, don't um, judge a book by its cover necessarily. Um, Andrew, uh, you mentioned this in your, in, in your briefing, strangle mutates. Um, but are some strains worse than others? Yeah, so probably, yes. Uh, so there's not actually been any head-to-head -head scientific studies looking at this, um, but there's, there's so much diversity out there uh, that almost certainly that will be the case. Um, when uh, I first started at the Animal Health Trust, uh, anecdotally, uh, there were more uh, sort of lymph node abscesses and things like that going on. Whereas nowadays, it's maybe more what we'd call atypical strangles that we see a lot of. Uh, so this is horses with nasal discharge and a fever, but maybe not so many that have obvious lymph node abscesses. Uh, they're the, the more classic signs of strangles. And that's perhaps been associated with a change in the strain from the group five strain that we had back in early 2000 through to this group two strain that we have uh, circulating today and causing almost all outbreaks in the UK today. They're still capable of causing classic signs as well and really severe cases, but maybe not quite on the same sort of scale. And then there was a paper in Germany that was quite interesting a couple of years ago where they had strangles happening every year in a group of foals, uh, but the foals were getting it really, really mildly. Uh, so very, very few of them get in uh, abscesses. And we sequenced that strain and it had a deletion in one of the key genes uh, in Streptococcus equi. So it was like a disabled form of Streptococcus equi that was causing uh, milder disease in, in those folds, but very reliably. And it was persisting year after year after year. I think they had strangles for 15 years on that yard. Oh. Um, so not necessarily a good thing. No, absolutely. Um, Thank you. And then, um, Nick, you mentioned disinfectants. Um, will all regular uh, disinfectants kill strangles? 
yeah, if you use them correctly and if you buy something reputable. So um, Vercon, for example, works really well, but it's a powder and on a windy day, you could probably have more in your lungs than in the bucket. So, you know, and if you've got lots of metal that you want to disinfect, um, there's suggestions that it can cause some corrosion. Um, so it's really about choosing the disinfectant for the circumstance. Also environmental runoff, you know, some places you might have good drains, uh, but anything that's DEFRA approved in the UK will be um, good against strangles. But um, I think the thing not to rely on is if you sprinkle a little bit of fairy dust on the top of a wheelbarrow full of strangles muck, it's going to do no good. So um, just like the vehicles, the transporters, you know, from all the work done over the years, um, it's cleansing and disinfecting. So getting rid of as much pus as possible. Um, so that's one of the reasons we say when horses are sick, nurse them well. Um, hot compresses are comforting for them, but also um, you can then smear all the pus that should be dripping onto the floor and into the water tank. You can clear that up and put that into a clinical waste bin. And then the disinfectant you do need to use at the end of the day doesn't have to penetrate through layers of really thick gooey pus uh, because um, Andy Durham did a great study where he left um, strangles not lurking in stomach tubes and in buckets in a shed during the winter, and it lasted for ages. Whereas, you know, on the surface of a fence post, a couple of hours of sunshine, it was gone. So it's not the most um, robust bug, but it can, inside its little globule of friends and family pus, survive for ages. So I think the big problem with disinfectants um, isn't whether you've um, got a disinfectant that's not working, it's probably whether you're using it right. Yeah, you mentioned DEFRA approved disinfectants, so I'll come to you, and where would you find information about that, uh, Nick? Um, it's usually indicated on the back of the bottle. Um, you can always look at the data sheet. I think it, if you find any product available online where they won't tell you about the studies done and send you the data sheet, then don't trust it. Yeah. So there's silver impregnated water. There's kind of you know various types of fairy dust. Um, there's magic water, which is usually just buying a, a factory that makes chlorine. So bleach and chlorinated waters can work, but they don't all work equally well. So it's really important. Andrew, you've probably got a bit more useful <laughs> info on that. No, I think the, the DEFRA, the DEFRA label is really, yeah, good advice. Yeah, just look for that. Uh, all I was going to add was about the water troughs. So in an outbreak situation or with uh, isolation quarantine, really important to disinfect the, the water troughs as often as you can. Uh, but also really important to rinse out the detergent, the disinfectant, after you've uh, decontaminated the water trough. Uh, we had one example many years ago where a horse had burns all around its mouth, yeah. and it was because they were adding the disinfectant to the water trough and just leaving it there, yeah. um, and the horses were drinking disinfectant. It's sort of the Donald Trump method for preventing strangles, uh, really. So not to be recommended. So make yeah. sure you rinse your water troughs. Yeah, sure. Brilliant. OK, listen, thank you for that. Now we've got a few questions coming in from, from the audience, which is great. So do remember, do chuck your questions in the comments function of Facebook or uh, in the Q&A function for Zoom um, and upvote those. But got some, actually some very, really good questions coming through. Uh, one from Facebook. Would a, um, a horse with chondroids be a, asymptomatic, Nick? Yeah, I think that's the whole point and the whole problem with strangles is that even though they can be quite inflamed inside the guttural pouches, usually from the outside, you won't notice. I think it would be really interesting to see whether or not somebody, so far the horses I've helped where the pouches have been really badly inflamed. The people haven't had the horse long enough to know whether or not, for example, he was a bit funny on the bridle or didn't like turning left and things like that. But I can imagine it could cause behavioral problems if it's really sore and inflamed, but by and large, when you first pop the scope into those pouches, it's as healthy as anything can be, apart from the chondroid sitting at the bottom. Um, and so, yeah, they are by and large, that's how they move around, is that people wouldn't necessarily buy a horse with a snotty nose. Um, so yes, asymptomatic carriers are the big problem. And actually we've even seen videos on the scopes where horses will have pus still draining out the guttural pouches, but it never makes it to the nose because they have a swallow and it just disappears down into the stomach. But every now and then enough of it will go into a water tank 
So I think it's very likely that um, horses that are a risk in terms of spreading the disease won't have any outward signs. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Nick. Um, Andrew, another Facebook question. Can a horse get strangles more than once? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately. Um, so there's been some studies done in the US. Uh, there were actually some studies done in the, uh, the British Army back in the 1900s, uh, looking at it. Um, and they saw that uh, around 75% of horses got strangles once and didn't get it again over a four year period. So uh, that's where some of the, the old historical data comes from, but probably a more accurate study was the US in the 1990s. And there they had an outbreak in foals and then the foals recovered. And they, uh, six months later, they then deliberately mixed those foals with another horse with strangles. And they saw 74% of those foals uh, were protected uh, at six months. But that still meant that some of those foals did develop strangles uh, again a second time, even though they'd just recovered from it six months previously. But they would have had a high dose. It was like the worst, worst case scenario. So certainly reducing the dose is like a consistent message here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Keeping the exposure down gives the, the horse's natural immunity more of a chance to, to fight it all off. Fine. Yeah, excellent. Andrew, I'm shocked that you've said a British Army piece of research might not be totally reliable. I'm, I'm utterly shocked by that. <laughs> but very historical. Um, next question. Thank you, Andrew. Um, how far away is a generic vaccine for strangles or might it become an annual vaccine with different strains, a bit like the human flu vaccine? Andrew, if I come to you on that. Sorry, I started reading that before. <laughs> so I'll come to you again. Yes. Yeah, so, so there is a vaccine already available uh, in Europe uh, produced by MSD. Um, and there's a new vaccine literally about to be launched in a couple of weeks uh, in the UK as well. Um, and as like a disclaimer, I work now for that company. Uh, just to make sure everyone's aware of that. So I'm not entirely impartial there. Uh, but yeah, so the vaccines are, are coming through and hopefully, hopefully they will make a difference. Brilliant. And so obviously the key message there is to take your veterinary advice. Not Absolutely. Only. Yes. Thanks, Roly. That's right. Yeah. Talk to your vet. Talk to your vet about the different, um, I mean, yep. all, all, the, there's lots of different vaccines for some diseases and, and yep. sometimes some can be better in particular scenarios, can't they? So yes, perfect. Uh, Brilliant. Thank you for that, Andrew. Um, Nick, you mentioned bastard strangles. What is it? So it's, I don't know who actually first coined the phrase, Andrew, in your various readings, you may have found it, but it's really where it escapes the head and the neck of the horse and gets to anywhere behind the ears and down. Um, and it's, it's mainly called bastard because I think it really does pose a risk. If these abscesses form in the chest or in the abdomen, it's got nowhere to drain out. And until they drain out, the horse's immune system and the strangles are at war. And it's, it's like the hundred year war, it's just never going to end. And so these abscesses just get bigger and thicker. And unfortunately what they do is they damage the organs that they sit next to. So the body's littered with lymph nodes. It's kind of um, your defense mechanism throughout the whole body. These lymph nodes are sitting everywhere, picking up whether it's infections coming in from a wound or through the skin. Um, and so if strangles gets beyond the head, where those abscesses form will be the disease that you then see. So we've sometimes seen bad pneumonias. Um, Norma that Andrew showed, she ended up where the abscess burst into her esophagus first and then eventually out through the skin. So she had this horrible hole that we couldn't fix um, because, you know, when they're swallowing, it's constantly getting um, infected. So there's no surgical solution there. But more often than not, it ends up in the um, abdomen as, and it causes colic because it tends to twist up the gut um, as part. And these abscesses are often the size of footballs. Um, and uh, they, they often have very few symptoms and still it all goes horribly wrong. Um, and so the, the phrase is coined really for when it's, when it's, um, when it's left town and caused chaos elsewhere. 
Excellent. Thank you for that. I, I, people who know me know what a juvenile humour I've. And I think if I was a scientist and I would have had the opportunity to name a disease, I'd name it something like, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, you could say the word in front of your parents. <laughs> but that, that says more about me than anything else. Um, um, Andrew, you, we've talked, um, you've talked a bit about this sort of laterally, but I mean, can a horse not be treatable? I mean, is it constantly have it strangled how often, however often hard, hard an owner tries? Yeah, to, um, in the studies that we did at the Animal Health Trust, um, I think pretty much every horse that was involved in an outbreak was able to be uh, cleared of strep. So all of the carriers that we were identifying were, were able to be cleared of uh, the strep equi. But I think there was one horse that was just so uh, badly behaved and dangerous that in the end it, it stayed in the field by itself, but it was a behavioral thing. It wasn't yeah. that it wasn't possible to treat it. Um, Nick, Nick will have much more experience of this, but yeah, I mean, it's, it, he's treated some amazing, amazing horses. What about Benny? Do you want to talk about Benny, Nick? Yeah, if, if you want to see Andrew getting excited, I think that Neil was even more, wasn't he? The, um, we got about 200 and something chondroids. I think we'd done it by scope three or four times, getting 10 or 20 chondroids out and then realized it wasn't going to work. We did surgery and got another 208 chondroids out of his head. Funny enough, he came from a, a home where the owner was a really good owner and she'd never noticed him have strangles. Um, so a classic example of, you know, kind of all those things we say you need to be careful of, Benny fitted the book. But interestingly, um, Surgery on the head is quite tricky. So with the scope, you can do so much. And then you have to question whether or not you're putting the animal through repeated procedures and they can get needle shy, they can get really fed up. Um, but the vast majority you can fix with the scope. But actually the surgery, you're, there's no way into the pouch without risking either causing them to bleed to death or cutting one of the main nerves of the head off. It's really quite tricky. Um, so usually it takes longer to get into the pouch with the knife than it does to actually sort out the problem once you're in. And if you knock them out, most of our cases have recovered, but not without some kind of hiccup. Yeah. So Benny actually, um, his, wind, his larynx collapsed, became paralyzed temporarily because of the trauma of our surgery. And he had to faint during his recovery in order for us to put a hole in his windpipe so that we could bypass the head because he just suddenly had this awful recovery. Um, and then after that, he went on absolutely fine, but we were really lucky there because he was a shy horse cross, so people could have got hurt. So it, it can get to the point where you have to question, I would say, you know, for example, uh, an older horse with Cushing's, mm -hmm. you might be finding that the horse's immune system is part of the problem now, and is it ethical to put that sort of horse through surgery? Um, and actually, funnily enough, more recently, at the, the most wonderful surgeon down at a vet's in uh, Essex, has, um, she came from the RVC and she saw it done there and she's done a few cases now of standing surgery on the guttural pouch. So the horse is sedated and she actually goes in from underneath and it actually makes it easier for the surgeon. And she's cured some really messed up pouches. One of the ones I showed you that was just rammed. She said once she made the hole, it just fell out. It was clean within minutes. Yeah. So in theory, you can fix them all if it's just in the guttural pouches, but you do always have to have that sort of thinking about how much is going to cost? What's the welfare impact on the, that individual horse? Um, and where does it fit in their overall quality of life and, and how much time they've got left anyway? Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Nick. That's excellent. Um, Trina's asked, uh, Andrew, uh, or, or you might want to hand it on to me, is strangles treatable with antibiotics? antibiotics? Uh, yeah, so a really great question. And uh, antibiotics are used to treat some cases of strangles. It's a all depends on the vet. Uh, some vets, if they catch it really early, uh, then you can control the infection and they say that it can prevent uh, strangles uh, and the abscesses uh, from forming. But if you're a little bit late uh, going in with the antibiotics, the abscesses have already formed and they, they, like Nick says, they get so big that the antibiotics can't penetrate in. So you might be able to shrink the abscesses down a little bit, uh, but when you uh, stop treatment, they can flare up again. And effectively, all you're doing is prolonging the period that the horse is actually ill for. Yeah. And there's a paper in uh, Sweden, a uh, group over there, 
and they've shown that the treatment of horses with antibiotics can actually dull down the immune response. So it might mean that they've not developed um, the optimal immunity. Um, I mean, they can still get strands if they get a high enough dose anyway, but you know, they might have dulled that down even more by using antibiotics. So it is a bit of an issue like that. Um, we've been sequencing strains of strep equi. Uh, the recent study, we've looked at over a thousand uh, genomes now, and you can actually start to see, particularly in South America, accumulation of uh, these uh, mutations in penicillin binding proteins. So that at the moment, the strains of Streptococcus equi are susceptible to penicillins, but we're starting to see early signs that they may well be reducing their susceptibility to penicillins. Um, and this sort of thing's happened before with human diseases. So pneumonia uh, in humans is a classic where ultimately you do, do then get strains that are harder to, to treat. So using antibiotics, it, it can be useful to, to rein in the disease to help horses get through a really difficult period. But if you can avoid using antibiotics, I think that's a really good thing. Brilliant. And that's actually, we've had another question about antibiotics. So that, that covers from Facebook. So that, you've answered that brilliantly. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Nick, we're coming near to the end. Um, and I'm just at the beginning of the webinar, I put a plug in about our next webinar, which is on the 1st of June, Bridal Fit, Why Getting It Right is So Important. I don't think we put in a, a, um, a link to that. So we'll put a link into that. But Nick, whilst we're doing that, um, this Facebook question, <laughs> I think, has really caught the, the crux of a challenge that many horse owners will face. What's the best way to approach someone on the yard who isn't that bothered by about biosecurity? Top tips. Yeah, it comes around to the whole question of are yards working as a community or is the manager of the yard actually able to set the behaviours either through their own behaviour or having having it clear from the outset that on my yard, things are going to go well. And I think you've got Cheryl Johns tomorrow uh, on a webinar where um, that's one of the things I think HS approved yards, ABRS. Um, there's a real drive, I think, for good livery yards. And through our Strangle survey, we saw that more clients now want to go into yards where there is biosecurity is an important part of it. I think we're getting we're getting to the point where we start to realize that our horses are a community, they're a herd on the yard, whether we like it or not. Um, and so obviously ostracizing that person doesn't help, but the manager can make it um, you know, a, a recommendation that they do stick by the rules. Good yards don't seem to have a problem filling stables when someone leaves. Um, but I think it's really interesting when you look at the COVID vaccine hesitancy, um, that everyone is basically an anti-vaxxer if they didn't have three jabs in their arm. And that's not fair because everybody often has good reasons why they might just be a little bit wary or hesitant. And I think sometimes one has to figure out, is there a reason why this person is reluctant? Um, have they, you know, have they had somebody else whose horse um, died because it was vaccinated for flu or they think there was a link? And I think finding out what's bothering them is helpful for those people who maybe just have some genuine questions. And then I think it's also important that, you know, if someone really just won't do it, that a well-run yard would say to them, look, you know, I can't have you on my yard if you're not going to play by the rules. You'll know it's all too well, Rody, with the issues going around with antimicrobial resistance, that there's a big uh, concern that um, we will end up having too few drugs. And actually, when it comes to wormers, we already know that we're on the cliff edge of a an epidemic of resistant worms that are just going to kill horses left, right, and center if people don't wake up. Um, and the, the, the same person who doesn't want to do biosecurity for stranglers could well be the same one who doesn't muck pick their paddocks and doesn't um, worm it count and just goes and buys wormers. So I think it's really important to understand what their reservations are, but if they are not willing to play ball, then I think it's important to think whether or not they are part of the community you want to be part of. Yeah, I think your point about the horse herd and actually, you know, in many ways it's a national horse herd and then but it actually breaks down into that into local horses and, 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 and yard, the yard herd. So I think that's a really good point. You also mentioned Nick, that uh, the webinar tomorrow, which is around strangles and livery yards, that's on Facebook at 10 a.m. 
uh, chaired by Andy McPherson from Red Wings and also got Abby McLennan, Cheryl Johns and Chris Shaw on it from those different charities. And actually, we've been working Andrew quite hard this week because Andrew um, was with Rachel Andrews from World Wars Welfare yesterday, focusing on strangles and competition. And they can all be watched via the uh, World Wars Welfare or Facebook um, or, or, Str- or Red Wings or other charities' uh, Facebook pages. So do go and look up on that. I think we've let you off after today, haven't we, Andrew? Isn't, it, isn't this your last uh, last session for the moment? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Until we come. And just I'm sure you, we'll do something else as well. I'm sure you are. I'm sure you are. If not, you certainly will be. Two very quick questions because we're almost out of time. Um, Andrew, you cut, touched on this. Is there a QPCR test? Yeah, so actually the, the, the picture that uh, Nick put up was a QPCR test. Yes. So um, that just means it can be done faster. So different labs run different technologies. Uh, but PCR polymerase chain reaction was the little diagram that we yeah, were showing yeah, absolutely. little bands amplifying up. And QPCR just means that you're quantifying the actual amount of signal that you get. And that was where I was saying about the 5,000 copies there. Uh, but you can still get a positive with a standard PCR, and that's going to be a reliable result as well. So if you get a, a PCR or a QPCR positive, then uh, hopefully, hopefully the vet will act on it straight away. Please, uh, brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. And the final question for you, Nick: How long after a strangles can a horse be transported? How, how long after a horse having strangles can a horse be transported? When you tested it and it's negative. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Happy days. You you heard it here. Well, you didn't hear it here first, but you certainly heard, heard it here very very clearly. Listen, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry we didn't quite get through all the questions, but we're sort of running low on time. We put a link in to our for our next webinar on the first of June in the chat for you, um, Andrew and Nick. Thank you. That that I mean, we, we there was so much information there, and and I know people will be able to go back because at, at times there was some quite intense information around testing and, and other. But I think you've been able to, in your summary, sort of really pick out some really. Um, key points and so maybe i'll come to you andrew and you know if you had to pick out a couple of key points from our discussion over the last last 90 or so minutes what what, what would it be yeah so i think the, the campaign this year is just so exciting uh, to to encourage horse owners to be checking the temperature of their horse know what's normal for their horse be able to see when a, a horse you know maybe after a, returning from a, an event uh, starts to spike a temperature and then there's this window of opportunity of a few days where that horse can be separated from every, everyone else's horse, put into isolation, checked by the vet, and hopefully a potential outbreak can be contained and restricted to just that one horse if it's going to happen. Um, so it's got fantastic potential, this campaign for BNL to reduce the prevalence of this disease. Um, and it's really uh, great to be involved in it all. Brilliant. Oh, and, and reality is you get many for the price of one, don't you? By yeah. monitoring your horse's temperature, it's not just strangles you're going to help. Pick up. Absolutely. Yeah, flu, herpes virus, like the outbreak in Valencia last year. Yeah, so many cases of that could have been avoided. Yeah. So brilliant. Well, you, yeah, that's, that, that's excellent. Thank you, Andrew. And, and Nick, what, what, what will your key message or key messages be? I think what you just said, Rody, that actually... Uh, Strangles is a, a, a good disease to get your head around because if you do good stuff around biosecurity for strangles, you've got half the other diseases ticked off. And if your mind thinks that way, I think we all love our horses. So this has just got to become a normal behavior for us to think about the bugs that can come along and spoil the fun, um, whether it's worms or lice or mites and get used to things like isolation um, and being a bit patient so that we can sort things out rather than paying the price afterwards and all goes wrong. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you. That, that's really good. And Strangles Awareness Re- Week runs all week. So please do look out on Red Wings, World Horse Welfare or other Facebook pages and you'll be able to um, and just Google Strangles Awareness Week and you'll be able to find out. There's a huge amount of information there. Um, I think one of the challenges with, with anything like this is that fact that, that, you know, you, you can just be it's going to be too much information, which is exactly why we put on the webinar this evening. Uh, uh, so that I just can't thank you enough for joining us and an even more big thank you to Andrew and to Nick for for giving up your time today to to join us on this webinar which will go on our YouTube uh, education channel 
So please do just Google World Horse Welfare Education Channel on YouTube. You'll get in there and you'll be able to play back and play this back to your yard. Because hopefully, especially if you've got a horse on a yard, we've given, given you some really helpful information about how to reduce the risk of strangles. And if you are unlucky enough, and all of us can be unlucky, to get a strangles case, then you'll know how, how best to quickly uh, support your vet in eradicating it. Brilliant. So listen, thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you on the 1st of June, just before the Platinum um, Diamond Jubilee weekend. I mean, Platinum week, uh, uh, Jubilee weekend. Um, and um, we will see you then on when we um, are very grateful to have Dr. Rachel Murray join us. But in the meantime, take great care. And Andrew and Nick, you're wonderful and your stars. Thank you very much. A pleasure. Take care, everyone. Cheerio. Thank you.